thank you, everyone. Um, as you already know, I'm Doreen Weissenhaus. I'm the director of the Media Law Project at the Journalism and Media Studies Center, where I've been teaching media law since 2000. Um, first of all, I, I know others have welcomed you, but I would like to welcome you all to Hong Kong as well and hope to have a terrific engagement and interaction. I have already heard from some attendants, attendees that they're frustrated, oh no, you know, they're just touching on certain topics. Really, the ambition of this conference is to touch on a number of key topics, but it's hope that you will use your time during the breaks, during the lunch, during uh, dinner tonight, um, and throughout the next couple of days to engage the participants with each other and network and be able to explore um, issues that you feel are very relevant uh, to your jurisdiction. So um, please be patient um, uh, with the conference itself. Now, I'm happy to see a lot of familiar faces here who I've gotten to know over the years. Rob Balin, uh, Charles Glasser, Peter Norlander, um, who've all been very helpful with our media law network established here in Asia. Uh, over the recent months and weeks of many hours of late night calls all over the world, I've gotten to know more of you. I'm glad to finally meet you. Uh, Heather, you are one. Uh, thank you for your terrific introduction to Lord Lester. But Please indulge me for a minute. I'd like to tell my own Anthony Lester story. So yours started with a phone call about a little project. Well, two years ago, almost to the day, I was uh, on sabbatical in the US in Seattle, and I received an email from Lord Lester, who started off by saying the magic words that gets any academic's attention. He read my book, and he liked it. <laughs> He's a consummate politician. And he wanted to discuss, quote, what's happening in London. So I just said, OK, I just begun my sabbatical. I had various deadlines. But little did I know what responding to his email would entail. I quickly realized what I was up against when he called me when I was in a hospital in Seattle awaiting the results of surgery my son was undergoing. While we were talking on Skype, you're great on technology, the surgeon came out, so I said to Anthony, I needed to go talk to the surgeon, and Anthony said, I'll wait. <laughs> so that's how I define relentless and a phenomenon uh, that in the words of Heather Rogers. But these are fantastic, great qualities because that's what you need, and that's what leads us to here, this historic moment in media law development. The nation that invented defamation has reshaped it. It's important to the UK, but is it to the rest of the world? And that's what we're exploring here today. He's given some suggestions and observations on what he thinks might be happening. And Lord Lester, we hope that you're right. Um, but we should care in great deal in part because of the nature of the common law world, which historically looks to the UK for developments in defamation in countless cases, such as Reynolds, Jamil, Flood, and so forth. But what will be the impact of this latest legislation, which other common law countries do not necessarily have to follow, but it might have some impact on both jurisdiction and legislation. And not only in other jurisdictions, but in the UK itself. Our speakers today will address some of those issues. We also encourage uh, many of our attendees uh, and experts in the audience today to contribute to the dialogue, and we may be calling on you as discussants to talk about your views. So Lord Lester has given a succinct summary of the two big issues that are the topic of this conversation. The first panel, led by Charles Glasser, gave a flavor on some of the issues we'll be tackling over the next couple of days, including internet liability, speech crimes, national security, special issues in China and Asia. What this panel proposes to do is delve deeper into the topic of defamation, uh, led off by Heather Rogers, as you know, who worked with Lord Lester in writing the reform legislation and who remains one of the top litigators in the UK, but also not on defamation, as you will be able to talk to her later about her work in privacy and breach of confidence and information about security issues. Uh, she's also the co-author of Duncan and Neil on defamation, so read up on her. 
The second speaker will be Professor Andrew Kenyon. I think many of you know him. He's a media law scholar from the University of Melbourne Faculty of Law and director of the Center for Media and Communications Law, which has a publication, a journal on media law in Asia, the only one of its kind. And he's going to give kind of a broader, more comparative perspective. Next uh, speaker will be Paul Chavez, who will give the Canadian context. He's a partner and a top litigator in Toronto with a broad litigation practice, emphasis on media and defamation, including he was counsel for the landmark case Grant v. Tolstar, in which a new defense to libel was established, reasonable communication in the public interest. Rick, uh, further down on the panel, uh, Golteski is a professor at Hong Kong U, and he's editor-in-chief of the Hong Kong Law Journal and keeps tabs not only on media law issues, but law developments in general. He's the author of the esteemed tort law in Hong Kong and a gifted teacher. He's written about defamation in Hong Kong and in fact has contributed um, that chapter for my book that's coming out soon. Harry Roque, how do I describe Harry? He's an associate professor at the University of the Philippines College of Law. Very active litigation practice, he's a tireless champion of press freedom in often creative ways. While most of our speakers on the panel today will look at civil defamation, he's gonna look at something that's very big in the Philippines and much of Southeast Asia, and that is criminal defamation. And he's been quite creative in how he's approached this. Some of his creativity includes going to the UN Human Rights Commission, to, which declared that his country's criminal defamation law was in violation of the right of freedom of expression. He's argued before the Philippine Supreme Court recently that the cyber libel laws provision in his country's new Cybercrime Prevention Act were unconstitutional. They're pending and waiting for a decision now and other activities as well. Um, we will, as you know, uh, be looking more specifically at the online rumor and criminal defamation issues in China, but that will be on a panel uh, tomorrow, so be on the lookout for that. So I introduce my first speaker, Heather Rogers. Now here's another real challenge for a lawyer, stick to a time limit. Um, okay, so. I'm going to talk a little bit about defamation from the perspective of England and Wales. And uh, we have the new uh, Defamation Act, not yet in force but passed, and it was a long road to parliamentary reform. And it was interesting the way that uh, the, the, the times change, the culture changes, and our new government in uh, 2010, the coalition agenda, uh, wanted to review libel laws to protect freedom of speech. So the recognition, the underlying basis is that we need to reform the law to protect free speech. The libel law it was too much of a restriction. And it was a long road. We said uh, Lord Lester produced his own private members bill. Then we had a government bill, a joint parliamentary committee report, consultation by the Ministry of Justice, government responses and so on. If for people who are interested in following the legislative history, I commend the Joint Parliamentary Committee Report, which is an expert report uh, looking at different aspects of reform. It's a very, very good uh, document. Uh, there were lots of parliamentary committees. Where we've got sort of consultation fatigue in the UK at the moment. Uh, we, we've had parliamentary committees from, on press standards and privacy, privacy and injunctions, investigative journalism, Levison, of course. Uh, and people are looking at it from a whole range of different uh, perspectives. Uh, and the joy of the internet is if you want to follow the uh, passage of the bill through Parliament, you can do that now on the Parliament website. You can see all the stages uh, right through from the original bill, through the debates, all the links are there on that, on that, on that site uh, and uh, up to the Royal Assent. Okay. One thing that has not changed is the essential basis of the claim. This is a publication-based tort. The means of communication have changed but the foundation, the publication of information from one person to another is the basis of this claim. Uh, and we work on the basis of the tendency of the words. And the old-fashioned nature of the way we formulate the claim, the protection of reputation, is protecting the claimant in the estimation of right-thinking members of society generally. Now, the, the whole idea that there are sort of right-thinking right members of society, or we can talk about society generally, 
when there's so many sort of different sectors different religions, different cultural bases on which people interact with each other. One question that has arisen in our case or not yet decided is, should we be looking at a kind of a reputation on a sectoral basis, or should we still be looking on a community-wide standard? We also, it's, this is a claim which is not based on damage. You do not have to prove damage as an essential part of the claim. We're looking at the tendency of the publication to affect you, to affect your reputation. And we look at the, uh, what the hypothetical, ordinary, reasonable reader thought. You don't call evidence from people saying, I read it, I thought this. Uh, I'm the neighbor, I thought that. We work on this idea that there is a notional, reasonable person, and it's their interpretation that matters. That basis of the claim has not changed. But what changes is the attitude to it. One important development, which originally came through, the, through our judge-made law, was the recognition in 2010, only three years ago, of the idea that a libel claim had to surmount a threshold of seriousness. The judge who decided this <coughs> was a judge who understood uh, uh, fundamental human rights. He understood the European Convention standards. He understood our Human Rights Act. So that, that was part of his approach to the cases so that when he was asked to say what does defamatory mean, he said there is a threshold of seriousness. And he did it by saying, by a, a very elaborate analysis of the case law, he didn't say I'm creating this, he said there has always been one. And I can justify that by reference to human rights standards. Now, the idea that there was always a threshold of seriousness came as a bit of a surprise to some practitioners in the field because we've been confronted down the years with many trivial claims. But this was a judicial recognition that the trivial claims could no longer go before the courts. And we see now in section one of the act, you, you, see, you see the defamation act, it's in the files behind the orange tab, that this idea that there must be, uh, there's a serious harm test. So we will now be excluding trivial claims. Another thing we're excluding, some types of claimants. Again, this was a judge-made change to our law, 1993, so a little bit further back, that governmental bodies cannot sue for libel. There's been a recent attempt to expand that. It's failed. But that's still a very important development of judge-made law. And another important aspect is excluding claims which are not real and substantial. The courts will not be bothered with a libel claim, they can strike it out as an abuse of our process if there is nothing at stake. Now, this is an evaluative process. We now have a clear statement of principle, but it is still going to depend on the application of judges uh, and their, which is why it's important, who is making these decisions matters very much. What is their basis for making them? What is real and substantial? Can someone vindicate their reputation? Is there compensation that's worthwhile? Can there, is there some proper advantage to be gained? Uh, and this was a, a sea change in 2005, judge made law by our appeals court. And just on Monday this week, there were two examples of, the, uh, of, of basically two new judges uh, looking at our media cases, striking out cases in a, as an abusive process. Uh, where you, on, on the Subotic case, there are, are uh, foreign claimants on both, on both sides. The Karpov case is a really interesting case. Massive publicity in, in the US and in Russia about the, the Magnitsky case. I could, you know, one could talk about that of its own. Um, and, uh, but basically, there was a libel against a police officer accusing him of complicity in torture and murder. And that was a claim, although that's obviously a very serious allegation. He had no connection with the British jurisdiction. No links there. So from a British perspective, looking at a six to eight week trial, the English courts say, we are not going to entertain this claim. It's an abuse for you to sue here. You can sue somewhere else. So whether maybe the Belfast will become the libel capital of the world. But this is a strong statement from London that you know we are not going to have these kind of cases anymore. So it's very important that the threshold tests uh, are, um, exist. OK. Some of our key defenses, can you prove truth? Is it honest opinion? Responsible journalism? Um, we have, we have the, the, those are the key, key defenses if a claim is brought. Responsible reporting. Um, Andrew's going to talk about this, I know. But again, judge-made law brought in this defense in 1999. 
It didn't work very well in practice because other judges were not following through the principles. So the case had to go again to our highest court at that time, the House of Lords, in Jamil and Wall Street Journal. And this court said, no, this, this defense is really important. It must work. And, and, uh, it, and it, 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 it did a bit. But it was still only in the flood case was the, f was the first time where a national newspaper successfully deployed the defense which had been recognized by our courts in 1999. Um, so um, I'm, the, the reason why it matters, why, why the Reynolds defense matters, whatever it's going to be called under, now, we've got now under section four of the act, responsible journalism is the point at which a fair balance is held between freedom of expression on matters of public concern and the reputation of individuals. And the maintenance of this standard is in the public interest and the interest of those whose reputations are involved. Whatever you do to defamation law, you are always going to have the tension between protecting reputation and protecting freedom of expression. You can have principles. Peter Norlander mentioned the, the difficulty of having hard and fast rules. You can state the principles, but the cases are still going to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, and this idea of the balance between reputation comes from our human rights standards in the European Convention, between Article 8 and Article 10. And the way our courts have approached it is to say neither article has precedence. You, you evaluate both of them. You exercise proportionality. Uh, and that is the running theme that which will be running through the development of case law under the Act. Um, honest opinion. We had a very complicated common law defense, which had so many uh, different aspects to it and become so technical that in practice, although everybody recognized it's important, it's a big defense, crucial to recognize the right to comment, the defense was so difficult to apply in practice that it was very rarely used and even more rarely succeeded. Now we have a stripped down version in the, act, in the Act. We'll see how that works. Again, you need to look at the detail of section three, but one can see the way it's gone. Um, proving truth. We still have a system in England and Wales where it is for the defendant who has to prove the truth. And that, of course, can be very difficult. Sometimes things can be true and you can't prove it. Or sometimes things are false, but you, the, the, play, the claimant does not have to prove it. We have, there is that, that, the, the requirement that defendants prove truth is consistent with, being held to be consistent with the human rights uh, standards. Uh, and now we have um, our section two. Uh, we, we have, uh, there are very recent examples of cases which have uh, looked at truth. The Rothschild case uh, shows uh, as of our appellate judges really appreciating that there is a public dimension to a libel case. A libel case is against the private rights of the citizen, against the person who's published, but there's a wider dimension to it. This is about the quality and the quantity of information that can be uh, uh, published uh, in, in our jurisdiction. Hunt and Times newspapers, this was the second success by a national newspaper on the public interest defense. Interesting for the discussion of the analysis of how the public interest defense worked, at least prior to the act, and also on justification. Crudders and Calvert, um, a case uh, I'm happy to not have time to talk about since it's one of mine and we lost. Uh, uh, we, we came a very emphatic, session, emphatic second, but we at least are seeking permission to appeal at any rate. Lots of interesting developments, um, lots of interesting cases. The, the political dimension where you have a claimant who is involved in politics, that's the most acute uh, form of tension. You can see that a greater judicial recognition in favor of free speech. And there are the, the late case against the Evening Standard and particularly the Waterson case are cases about politicians. Um, and perhaps we can p pick it up in, in, in Q&A. Um, but even on a case like Waterson, where a local newspaper said that the conduct of a, of a local MP who had taken parliamentary expenses to buy a house, allegedly to be nearer to the constituency, but in fact 70 miles away, the local newspaper said, this is a scandal. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the libel claim was kind of created to be uh, in, uh, an artificial meaning. And, and, and the, the judge upheld the claimant's case. 2-1 in the Court of Appeal, a recognition that this is a local newspaper which stated basic facts. The man was a, the, 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 the politician bought the house. It was miles out of the constituency. That's a scandal. That's all it was. And that was very important to be published. Internet, well, 
<laughs> massive problem. Happily, I'll, I'll pass on there's a different panel about this, but the Tamiz and Google case, the responsibility of for publication in, uh, in, in, in English law uh, is, is very complex. We have now an old act. We have a 1996 act. We have regulations which were made under European law, not, not Strasbourg, but, uh, but the European Union and now interrelating with the Defamation Act 2013. Absolutely fascinating. The lawyers don't know we're playing catch up. The politicians don't know we're playing catch up. Technology is moving. What are we gonna do? Um, just two points to close, and I'm, I have already failed with my time limit, but only just. Defamation claims have always been very, very polar. You win, you lose. You get your damages, you don't. You get your injunction, you don't. It's a little bit more complex now in the internet age if you have a defense, you say, I published this, it was in the public interest when I published it, and you publish it and it's on a website, whether it's a blog, whether it's a newspaper, circumstances change. What happens? Can you carry on publishing it if you find out that it's untrue? If, if somebody is subject to an inquiry but they're vindicated by an inquiry? Should there be a right to a remedy? Should someone just have a right to reply? Should the court say this is false? I think there are real problems about the court declaring falsity. But uh, should we have a more subtle approach to, if, rather than saying you win, you lose, you pay massive costs, you don't pay costs, should we be looking at what is really at stake? What do people really want? Uh, and this, I promise, is my, is my last thought. Practice and procedure. We, we are basically doing away with jury trial in Britain. It, it's a, a rather sad day because there's something about having the people in the, as, as representatives coming into court and de determining why, where the balance should lie, which is very important. Um, it, it's basically gone because the costs of proceedings were so high. But we really do have to look, as our responsibility as lawyers, uh, the, our judiciary, our politicians, to look at costs, to look at the way we uh, deal with our cases, to make our court systems more effective to deal with those cases which will have to come to court. There are always limit cases which can't be settled, shouldn't be settled, and how can we make sure that the limits are set without undue cost and without um, <coughs> undue sacrifice either of the rights to reputation or the rights to free speech. Not only do you get our applause for a wonderful talk, but you really did come in very close on time. There you go. <laughs> Andrew, um, I want to stand up, that'd be great. Um, and I think you did a really good segue to uh, Andrew's talk, what's really at stake, what, people, what do people really want, and is there a more subtle approach that could be taken? I have my own timer, as you might have gathered from my little buttons there. So I'll try and keep this short. Uh, you've got a written paper in the um, materials, and I'm just going to draw out a few points from that and um, also make some wider comments. The paper's called Rethinking Reynolds, Defending Public Interest Speech. So I'm really looking at the way Reynolds emerged. It, there seemed to be problems with it in practice. The courts tried it again. And now Parliament has acted and really just asking some questions about what has it done and what effects might it have. I want to start by noting defamation law has long been criticised. More than 50 years ago, witnesses to the Porter Committee, a committee investigating defamation in the UK, commented on the law and practice in terms such as it being unnecessarily complicated, unduly costly, difficult to forecast the result, and liable to stifle discussion upon matters of public interest and concern. About 25 years later, in the 1970s, another inquiry, uh, the Forks Committee observed much force in similar criticisms about the law. So these sort of concerns about the complexity of defamation law, the cost of litigating it, the lack of predictability, and the effects on public debate, I think are worth noting when thinking about the latest reforms. I think they are a good effort in many ways. I think they do aim to uh, more strongly protect freedom of speech without ignoring reputation. But I think there are real questions about how effective they're going to be in the longer term. In the decades since Porter, that first report, reform through case law and legislation has increased protection for defamatory speech. But during the same time, the public understanding of what speech warrants protection has increased, and I think probably increased even more. So these sorts of complaints still exist. Now what I want to do is look at 
one of these reforms, the public interest defence that is replacing Reynolds. Um, I pick it in part because I think that defence is really important. It was also repeatedly referred to as the heart of the bill in parliamentary debates. And it was a significant element of concern raised by um, reformers. And I, I was in England during early parts of this campaign. I attended a gala charity comedy event <laughs> at a big theatre in the West End, packed with lawyers and members of the general public supporting defamation reform. Uh, this is not something <laughs> I would expect to see in um, Australia. <laughs> Perhaps not in Hong Kong, I don't know. It's also an incredible change from the 1952 Act, which Lord Lester mentioned. It did only make some minor changes. It was described at the time as lawyer's law. Now, this isn't very important. Defamation doesn't matter. The perceptions have really changed, and I think rightly. So this new defence, I want to say a little bit about the defence itself, uh, about the parliamentary debates, um, and then maybe some guesses about possible effects. Um, just before I get to the defence itself, I'd note I see this change as one reform in actually a much longer period of reform that's dealt with two types of privilege. And the other one, which doesn't usually get talked about in this, is the privilege for fair reports. Right? A fair report of parliament, of courts, of public meetings. Right? There have been these statutory provisions for the media to be able to publish fair reports in different forms for 120 years. They've got wider and wider, and the new Act has widened them again. Very often, they are subject to a requirement that there be a reply or a response. If the person attacked asks to have their side published, and it's reasonable in the circumstances, that has to be done for the defence to exist. Traditionally, the common law didn't protect any general publication by qualified privilege. It was rare instances to protect the media. And then Reynolds developed. And similar developments happened in a host of countries. Australia, Brunei, Canada, Hong Kong, India, Ireland, Malaysia, New Zealand, South Africa. I'm sure I have missed some. Right? A whole lot of countries did something broadly similar to Reynolds before or after in the last couple of decades. But it didn't follow that model. It didn't follow the model of the fair reports. And I don't know if it should have. I think it's actually quite interesting that it hasn't. And there may be room for some sort of report, fair report type privilege to help protect speech more than the new Reynolds defence. Now, let me move on to the defence itself. Um, section four, there's two key elements. It protects a statement uh, on a matter of public interest. Uh, that's very broad. It has been in, under Reynolds. It will still be broad. The defendant has to have reasonably believed that publishing the statement was in the public interest. Statements in the public interest, and it's a reasonable belief that this was in the public interest. Now, there's a few other things that the court has to have regard to all the circumstances. There's a provision that protects the idea of re reportage. Um, if you're reporting a, a, a dispute uh, that, that is noted, and um, in deciding whether the defendant reasonably believed publishing was in the public interest, the court must make such allowance for editorial judgment as it considers appropriate. Now, that recognition of editorial judgment is important, but on its face, that wording's quite different to Reynolds. And it's interesting that it arose in part through flood and the parliamentary debates. And I think there's real questions over time as to whether it will be interpreted by the courts in a very different, much more robust way than Reynolds, or will end up being interpreted pretty much the same. And I think either is possible. Um, one of the things I want to do by mentioning the parliamentary debates to you uh, is to note there was a clear intention that it be a bit stronger. Uh, I think that's how it should be interpreted. When the defence, uh, the proposed statutory defence first was introduced into Parliament, it was broadly like Reynolds. It was a list of factors. Uh, it, it was about responsible publication. That was a, a key topic of debate in both houses, and particularly the House of Lords. And one of the, the points was about a list of factors. 
uh, and very strong statements were made against how that list had been used uh, by courts, really as a series of hurdles. And overall, the list of factors was seen as either unworkable or not working sufficiently well. So what happened instead is it's a very general test really left up to judges. This is reasonable and reasonable belief. Uh, this is in the public interest and reasonable belief that it's in the public interest. I want to pick up one point um, which Lord Lester may have uh, be able to explain more about, which is when wording first was introduced, uh, it, as I understand, came from the suggestion of Sir Brian Neill. It was in very similar to, to what finally came in. So public interest and a reasonable belief in that. But the defence would have been subject to a correction being published if requested by the claimant, and I think if it was reasonable in the circumstances. <coughs> that is, it would have been subject to something like the fair report requirement. Now, the, that did, wasn't carried on in debates, and it doesn't appear to have been considered further. And so what was left with is something much more like Reynolds. Um, and I'll close in a couple of minutes. Yeah. Um, just coming back to that point about this idea of a, a response. I want to mention one other thing about the debates, which was what's called a pepper and heart statement which is a statement that can be made in Parliament really to, to help guide courts where there might be something ambiguous in, in the wording. And one aspect of saying the defendant has to uh, reasonably believe this was in the public interest, there were concerns this could start getting into inquiries into the motive of the defendant. Uh, now, it was felt overall that wasn't likely to happen, and a statement was made to that effect. And this was really following the decision in flood and so the statement reads, the courts have made it clear in cases such as flood that considerations about motive are usually irrelevant. Right? Whether I have a reasonable belief this is in the public interest. My motive isn't part of that. And it's unlikely that the courts would entertain such arguments if they were to arise. We are satisfied our wording accurately captures the essence of the flood judgment. Right? It then goes on. In addition, the emphasis that the government have placed in debates, which I reiterate today, on our intention to reflect flood, will leave courts that there's no doubt that's the case. And I'm slightly ambivalent about that last sentence, because reflecting flood could also be limiting the law to flood. It's almost as if one interpretation that might come out of all this is flood becomes like a new statute. Uh, there's a couple of paragraphs which I quote in the paper and get quoted in Parliament. The judge said this, what does it mean? Now, I'm not really sure that was the intention. I think they clearly wanted to say, motive is not the key issue here. And overall, the debates make quite clear, to quote uh, Lord McNally, this is a genuine attempt to strengthen freedom of speech, and it should be seen as such. Right? So it should be a broad, flexible, and strong defense. Now, let me close by just noting as I've said, this model, this new public interest defence, continues one element of Reynolds. It's a complete defence. Right? It doesn't have any subject to a response being published if requested. Now, I wonder, in light of new communications technologies, and also the history of defences like Reynolds being interpreted restrictively, there might be a, a, an avenue for some sort of public interest speech perhaps speech about politicians, right? Narrower category to actually have a stronger defence. Perhaps a defence subject to a response where that was reasonable. Wouldn't necessarily replace this. But if this doesn't develop into a strong defence, you're still going to have these problems. Um, and I'm not sure that it's appropriate, one, for the media, but even more so for individual speakers. Individual speakers who've got a lot more access to a public now maybe can do harm, but is subjecting them to defamation litigation and the threat of damage is the best way to deal with it. It seems a, a really um, <coughs> large waste of public resources, apart from anything else. So in short, I'm sort of asking whether stronger protection for speech that acknowledges interests in reputation might require an extra form of defence that itself supports a discursive remedy. 
And remember, this fair report one is only one where the defendant agrees to do that. Anyway, I'll leave it there. Lord Lester, um, as a moderator of this panel, I can kind of break from the format a little bit. And um, uh, Andrew raised a question directly to you about why um, certain aspects were not included, such as correction and right of reply and so forth. Perhaps if you can enlighten us a bit. Um, Lord Dyson, I think I'm right in saying, uh, had emphasized in his speech um, the importance of, of uh, judges not becoming editors. Uh, and the problem we faced as legislators was that we were abolishing the, the Reynolds defense. Uh, I was very worried, uh, we were very worried, that by abolishing uh, that defense, we would be retrogressive in, in not preserving the new statement of principle by Lord Dyson. We had, therefore, a great discussion in Whitehall as to what to do, what to do about it. And the part that we inserted about editorial judgment was put in to make quite sure that it would not be retrogressive, but would capture what had been decided uh, in flood. Uh, um, because we were abolishing the common law, it was vital that we didn't uh, abolish something very good that had recently happened. Uh, we dealt, of course, with rapportage uh, in section before itself. Um, I, I myself do not uh, I think it's sensible, by the way, to start, if that's what you're saying, I don't think it's sensible to start having special categories of information that are dealt with in some privileged way. Um, but that's another story. That's why we did it. Thank you. Andrew? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, OK, so Paul, uh, if you can uh, share your experience in Canada and what may or may not be impacted by the UK legislation. OK, well, thank you very much, Doreen. And may I start by thanking uh, Doreen and Simon and the others for inviting me to Hong Kong. I'm very pleased to be here as a self Conscious Canadians are always pleased when people recognize that North America doesn't consist only of the <laughs> land of the free and the home of the brave. Uh, we may sound similar, but uh, certainly our laws are quite different than the United States. Um, and maybe I can just give you a little background, just to, uh, there, there is some relevance to this, because of course, as you will likely know, Canada was the first colony that was peaceably granted its independence from England back in 1867, though we still had appeals to the Privy Council until 1949. I guess we were the first ones to sever that as well. Uh, but even before then, our court, our Supreme Court, um, addressed the issue of right of reply in an old case uh, from Alberta where uh, the government passed a law that said if they're criticized, they have a right of reply. And using uh, the common law and our constitution, which in those days didn't yet have a, an entrenched bill of rights, but was founded on a, having a constitution similar in principle to that of the United Kingdom, the court held that it was beyond the powers of the provinces to enact laws that would limit freedom of, or infringe freedom of the press by that sort of forced speech. We did adopt a Charter of Rights in 1982 with uh, a modern constitutional document, very much uh, modeled on uh, 20th century international human rights documents, so quite different from that uh, old, uh, old document that still drives everything in the United States. Um, we had high hopes uh, for quick uh, change, uh, including in libel. Those, the, the, the libel hopes were dashed. Uh, for quite some time, though we did see um, uh, pretty good developments in other areas involving open courts, striking down false news, scandalizing the court, and, and the general recognition of the strength of free speech. But we did have a setback in 1995 with a, a, a major libel case that went to our Supreme Court where um, there was an effort to say, let's look to the South and adopt New York Times on Sullivan. Uh, this is the, the perfect storm of, a, of bad facts 
uh, leading to a horrible decision, just like fantastic facts led to the New York Times and Sullivan case, because of course it was a, a great civil rights case. Uh, you left out Martin Luther King and Eleanor Roosevelt being signatories to the ad. What better um, uh, defendants could you have? Uh, uh, what, what worse defendants could you arguably have than the, the Church of Scientology uh, attacking a Crown Attorney, which is what we had <laughs> in Canada. And so we ended up with a decision which just talked in, in the most uh, um, rhetorical terms about the value of reputation, including the line that set us all back. Surely it is not requiring too much of individuals that they ascertain the truth of the allegations they publish. Now, sure, we should try to ascertain the truth, but sometimes you can't do that. And we were very much set back by Hill and Scientology um, and watched with some envy as the English, even before uh, the Human Rights Act was enacted with Lord Lester's success in Derbyshire and then in Reynolds, we saw the, the laws developing in Canada and we were very much uh, uh, held back by this holding in Hill and Scientology. We did have some chipping around the edges. Um, Hill itself acknowledged a qualified privilege for reporting on uh, court proceedings. Um, we adopted the lesser meanings uh, plea that uh, was adopted in England in the Polly Peck case. And we did, uh, without saying so, effectively adopt to some degree a reportage defense um, of fair reporting. We called it an allegations defense. If you wrote something and reflected that it was allegations or reporting on a public meeting, those were all at lower levels. Um, and then finally, about five years ago, our Supreme Court uh, was confronted with a number of cases and I think in part was sort of shamed into the realization that Canada was falling behind the rest of the common law world and uh, had to address defamation um, head on. And it did so in a number of cases, um, most notably the Grant and Torstar case, which is the case that adopted what we in Canada called uh, public interest responsible communication. Um, it was clearly uh, drawing from Reynolds and Jamil at the time, but we did, uh, we did go our own way in a number of ways there. Um, the court effectively said it's a two-part test. Is it in the public interest? And secondly, is it, was it responsibly published? Now, to determine that second part, um, the court listed seven non-exhaustive factors. Uh, they were very clear to say they are not hurdles and they are not exhaustive. Um, and they reviewed some of the Reynolds uh, uh, factors and expressed some concern about some of them. One in particular that uh, the court took issue is with was, was the, the tone factor and said that's just too vague and we should expect criticism to be trenchant and use strong language and, and free speech should not be chilled because of some uh, judge's view uh, uh, that the tone was inappropriate. Uh, we called it responsible communication, not responsible journalism. Um, how do you answer the question, what's a journalist? And the, the court didn't have a good answer, nor did I when I was asked that in the, in the court. And uh, the solution was to say it should apply um, to the blogger as well as the journalist. There may be differences in how that uh, plays out, but we have yet to see that. Um, a third issue, which no one's really talked about yet, um, which is mentioned in, our, in the Grant case, is, and it's kind of an offhand couple of lines, is it says, of course, malice can defeat the responsible communication defense. This is something that uh, always troubles me and has troubled me in some trials I've had since then, uh, because it seems to me that malice, in the sense of a dominant motive being an intent to injure, which, which could be found in an unfortunate email, for example, between a couple of journalists perhaps saying as they start out on a story to say they want to get somebody and we, could, we can get the goods on him and that's great evidence of malice. But why should that defeat the defense if you then go and investigate and report it responsibly? And our court didn't really address that and I'd really like to see that addressed. Um, another difference which is troubling and it's, uh, it's an argument I specifically lost in Grant is the issue of the role of the jury. Um, uh, unlike the Reynolds and now the, uh, the Defense and the Defamation Act, which is for a judge alone, um, in Canada, the court held that if there is a jury trial, and it's uh, at the election of either party, whether there's a, to be a jury, 
um, the jury considers the second part of the defense. So it's a matter of law for the judge to determine whether it's a matter of public interest, as it is in the defense of fair comment, for example, as well. But when you get to the second part, that's a question of fact they held, um, that it's for the jury to decide uh, whether um, the publication was uh, responsible. Uh, to me, that really, uh, ignores what I think the, the court got right in Reynolds, which is we are balancing competing constitutional interests, and uh, that's really something that a, a, a judge is better equipped to do than a jury. Um, but uh, eight of the nine judges in the Supreme Court saw it differently. Um, we haven't seen much since Grant uh, in so far as application. There have been some lower court decisions. There have actually been a couple of jury cases. I've seen some brief charges in some relatively straightforward cases to tell the jury what responsible communication is. Um, there are uh, a few cases that have just been tried, and I'm expecting that we'll see some, some jurisprudence develop. But I would say that since Reynolds, and spe specifically since the Grant case in Canada, uh, there has been much more public awareness of the role of the media in reporting responsibly on things they can't prove to be true. Um, it, there have been a number of very good investigative stories that have been published over the last seven or eight years uh, exposing uh, uh, political um, transgressions, exposing uh, abuses that have led to changes in laws that have involved prominent people, such as exploitation, for example, of nannies, for example. Um, we had a huge sponsorship scandal that really spelled the end of the liberal, long-time liberal government in Canada. Um, and uh, most recently, um, some of you may have had the misfortune to read about the mayor of Toronto, where I live, um, who, uh, uh, in addition to being a buffoon and, and, uh, and a bully, I say that as statements of fact, um, <laughs> um, also may have a, a crack cocaine addiction. Um, and uh, the, the press have reported on this uh, only after Gawker originally uh, did so, but nevertheless reporting that two of the reporters had seen a video um, which some drug dealers had tried to sell them for $100,000 and they balked at the price um, uh, of him smoking crack cocaine. And, and uh, there have been a whole series of other stories about this mayor, still our mayor. Um, <laughs> and, but in reporting on all of these things, our press have been educating uh, their readers as to why they're reporting this and why they feel it's appropriate to report these things when they can't prove that it's true. And just a few days ago, uh, are the Ontario Press Council, which is a voluntary organization that the newspapers belong to, um, addressed this uh, because there was a complaint about how they had been reporting on the mayor. And uh, the, the Press Council came out with an interesting decision, very uh, publicly reported, on the fact that this is responsible journalism, what's going on to report on these things. It's very much strongly in the public interest. So it's a very interesting, sort of more public application of this that gets us out of the uh, the, the lecture halls and the courtrooms. Um, just uh, two other very quick points. Um, we've also seen the expansion of fair comment in a case called WIC Radio. A terrific decision. It's all in my paper, which is in the materials, I think, right after Andrew's paper, um, that adopted uh, an objective test for fair comment. Um, we didn't need to. Uh, um, have the, uh, the, the, uh, par our parliament uh, correct that law, um, as the English are now doing. And then finally, I wanted to mention, um, what's all this talk about Belfast? Uh, I've always, I've always uh, you know, envied, again, the English lawyers for that economic engine of libel tourism in London, and I kept saying, why not come to Toronto? <laughs> Bel Belfast or Toronto? I mean, really. Uh, we have had some libel tourism in Canada. I don't know why we don't have more. Um, I guess it's, again, our, just our inferiority complex as Canadians. Um, Toronto's a great big city. You know, um, I, I'd welcome more of it. But it, and, it, and in fact, uh, it, all kidding aside, though, uh, Canada is open for business because our Supreme Court, in a case involving uh, Conrad Black, Lord Black, as he's known in the United Kingdom, um, uh, held that uh, uh, as long as uh, material is downloaded or read in Canada, the Canadian courts have jurisdiction subject to the forum non-convenience test, which is a, a not very satisfactory uh, discretionary test. 
Um, we don't have the serious harm hurdle yet. Um, uh, we don't have a, a, a strong abuse of process or other preliminary arrangements to get rid of cases. So uh, I'm actually seeing an increase in, uh, in some libel tourism cases. I'm just waiting for the Russian oligarchs to, to come in. Um, so with that, I'll Thank turn the mic you, over to Paul. others. <laughs> That sounds like an advertisement to come to Canada. Okay. <laughs> I could see it now, the public service announcements. <laughs> Thank you. Lord Lester, you had something you wanted to say. I just wanted to say one thing which I probably should have said before about how I lost the Reynolds case. Oh. Uh, because it's quite important to those of you interested in comparative law yes. to see the dangers of a little learning. What happened, in, what happened in Reynolds was that I was in the middle of extolling the virtues of the American positions when Lord Stain said to me, what about German constitutional law, Mr. Lester? And I said, what about it? <laughs> and he said, he said well, uh, have you not read the essay by Sansa? And I said, no. And he said, you'd better have read it by tomorrow morning. So. Uh, I read it and the next day came in and explained why uh, German constitutional law did not seem to me to be the satisfactory approach. Uh, and what it was about was that the great virtue of the American position, before they got mucked up about the uh, uh, public figure uh, ambiguity, is that it drew a bright line. It was clear. It was a kind of common law, fairly clear rule. The problem with German constitutional law is it was about ad hoc balancing with no principles or criteria. And unfortunately what happened in Reynolds is that German constitutional law, albeit expressed in a different way, came into the common law and, may, and became unworkable. What the statute does in section four is to restore some clarity into the principle. Last point is that uh, I then approached a German, the president of the German Constitutional Court, no less, and I said to her, well, what do you think about German ad hoc balancing in free speech cases? And she said, it's ludicrous, it's a cop-out, there are no criteria. So all of this shows that it's dangerous when English judges dabble in things they don't know anything about, <laughs> namely German constitutional law, and make advocates do the same. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> So, for the Hong Kong perspective, Rick. Good afternoon. I'm told I have 10 minutes, and uh, I will uh, I will meet that. Uh, now, um, I will speak a little bit about the Hong Kong experience. Uh, in particular, uh, I will speak about um, the way that the courts have played a role in bringing about reform of uh, libel law in Hong Kong, and I will touch on a number of general issues in the process. Um, as Lord Lester uh, suggested earlier today, in Hong Kong, we rely on the courts to a large degree for law reform because the other instruments of reform, the more uh, obvious instruments of reform, uh, don't necessarily work all that well uh, when they are needed. And, and I include, in, uh, with some sadness, uh, the role of the Law Reform Commission, which has not, which has produced many wonderful studies, but has yet not has, does not see those uh, studies uh, brought into law. Um, I also note that um, uh, much of the Defamation Act 2013. Uh, it was triggered by developments in the case law or our extensions of developments in the case law. So I think that both uh, as Lord Lester and as Heather have pointed out, um, uh, we can trace the modern reforms to judge-made law uh, and that makes a case for the relevance or the importance of understanding judge-made law in Hong Kong. Now um, I have a few slides and I, I, I'm not, not so many, they will 
be made available on the website uh, later today. Uh, so you needn't uh, worry if you're trying to write down a citation. I'm not going to refer to a lot of cases, so don't worry. Um, the list on the screen uh, is really what uh, Lord Lester mentioned this morning, only now it's, it's sort of presented in a different way. Uh, Lord Lester uh, and uh, Heather have highlighted uh, what the Defamation Act 2013 has brought about. And that largely consists of the list of what I would call the differences between the current Hong Kong law and, and that in the UK. So I needn't go through those, but you can see them very quickly. They will look familiar to you. In other words, our law is unreformed uh, as far as uh, statutory uh, changes go. Uh, we are uh, making some progress uh, through, through the, the case law. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do, and uh, as I, I remind you again, this will be on the website, uh, is just to touch, discuss three cases, three cases of the Court of Final Appeal that have taken place in the last year. So the three cases are on the screen. Uh, they are rather different, but there's one thing that you will notice about these cases is that two of them are in green. Uh, and, and, and that is because uh, it is effectively the same plaintiff. And interestingly, the plaintiff is a, a, a newspaper, uh, a group of newspaper companies. And uh, in Hong Kong, uh, the newspaper companies initiate an extraordinarily large body of, uh, of the defamation case law. And I suppose the libel lawyers in Hong Kong should be grateful to the Oriental Daily Group <laughs> for regularly, at least two or three times a year, bringing an action. Normally, they are, you would think that the media are the defendants, but, but here in Hong Kong, they are equally the plaintiffs. The first case is an internet case I'll speak about briefly. It has to do with uh, online uh, website hosts, a very busy discussion forum in that case. Uh, the second case is not about the media per se, although the statement made by the Cathay Pacific spokesman was made in the form of a press release. He was commenting on the... Um, the conduct of striking or, or, or uh, at least pilots that were taking industrial action. Fifty pilots were, were terminated and then the, the, um, the spokesperson for Cathay Pacific took the opportunity, why, why one wonders, took the opportunity to say some bad things about those terminated pilots leading to, a, among other things, a wrongful termination action but as well as a defamation action. And then the third case has to do with, with I guess what you might call reportage, uh, the Ming Pao newspaper um, uh, published a photograph that contains some libelous material, libelous of the Oriental Daily Group. So these are, are three quite different um, uh, cases, two of them involving plaintiffs as, who are from the media. And these cases, uh, the second two uh, will have provided some reform in the way of damages awards. That is, I, I call it reform because you will see that the Court of Final Appeal is suggesting that damage awards be moderate uh, so far as possible in order that they not have a chilling effect. Now, um, then let me turn to the, uh, the first case that I mentioned, the Oriental Daily and Fever Works case. The, there's a, a bit on the screen, I hope not too much, um, that uh, will tell you about the case. Uh, the Court of Final Appeal described this as perhaps the first such case with this, these kinds of facts uh, in, in the common law. Um, there are similar cases in, in the UK, but they often involve Google or, or search engines or, or whatnot. Uh, and there is a, some similarity to the Godfrey case, but in this case, the defendants hosted discussion forums. And they were very busy, up to 5,000 postings an hour. Uh, the, those who would post would have to be registered and they have to register with a traceable email address so they couldn't completely hide. I mean, they used pseudonyms when they did their postings, but they couldn't hide because they, were, they, could be, they knew that they could be traced if, if it came to it. Uh, so there were the uh, libelous postings made against the Oriental Daily Group and uh, the, found, the founding family uh, of the Oriental Daily Group uh, and the Court of Final Appeal uh, then considered whether or not uh, the, the the website host, or the, the, the discussion forum host, would be liable uh, in, uh, in defamation. Uh, and, and here, uh, I think that the court made considerable progress uh, in, in, um, in, let's say, uh, taking a, a, a modern or, or, or liberal, or liberal approach regarding internet communications. But uh, as I will point out later, there, is, there was a difficulty experienced in, in the Court of Final Appeal, as in the lower courts, as to what should be the theory that it would explain why 
uh, a company that organizes uh, and encourages uh, people to make postings, um, uh, wh whether they should be a, considered a publisher or a, a first publisher, a subordinate publisher, or was this really a notice board case whereby we should analogize with those cases like Byrne and Dean? Uh, and uh, the court finally preferred the, uh, the first publisher, subordinate publisher distinction, finding this defendant to be a subordinate publisher on the basis that it does not know what is being posted at any given moment and doesn't really have the ability to exercise complete control over what's being said. And that's not entirely convincing, I don't think, but then again, perhaps neither is the, the notice board uh, analogy because uh, it doesn't really analogize well to Bernardine either because here the defendant notice board uh, owner is encouraging posts. In fact, as the Court of Final Appeal acknowledged, is encouraging controversial posts, n not insipid or boring material, otherwise this, the website won't be successful. So anyway, the court came to the view that this was really a case of a subordinate uh, uh, publisher and uh, uh, per permitting the defense of innocent dissemination to be available. And the court found that in all of the circumstances, the defense was made out regarding uh, two of the postings. Two of the postings were of which uh, the defendant became aware of or notified of uh, were removed within a few hours of it knowing of it. So the court thought that that satisfied any requirements. Uh, so, uh, so that, I think, by and large, represents uh, progress as, as, a, as a, uh, I think, a, a, the kind of approach that's required with the new media. Um, but uh, as I said, there are some problems with it, it and, and going forward, uh, uh, there may be further problems and may be the reason why some statutory intervention is required. The other case that I, the second case that I'd mentioned and is now on the screen, that's the Cathay Pacific case. And as I said, that was a, in the context of an industrial action taken by uh, pilots. And here, this is a, an, an example of some further reform undertaken by the Court of Final Appeal in that it extended the so-called the public interest defense from Reynolds and Jamil, here called responsible public dissemination, extending that defense to anyone, anyone who is making uh, a statement uh, or publishing something that is in the, in the, in the public interest. Uh, and this, as I said, took place in the context of a, of a press release. Um, then uh, the, the remaining discussion about reforms has to do with the assessment of damages. And the, 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 the second and third cases that were on the previous screen uh, involved uh, quite a bit of discussion about how damages should be assessed in libel cases. And a number of observations were made which suggest that awards will be more moderate. First of all, regarding internet postings, the fact that many of them are anonymous should, should suggest that they will not be taken that seriously, which should, should suggest that the harm isn't that great. Moreover, the internet uh, it often involves a large turnover of postings uh, and that also suggests that, um, that they may not be taken that seriously. Uh, and this is, I think, a, quite an interesting point, really, whether uh, this is really true, whether, whether people are ignoring what's on the internet because it's, after all, it's only on the internet, or whether it is now uh, having more uh, meaning to people. Um, the court also said that uh, there's no presumption that internet publications are widely disseminated, so there, there must be evidence before the court uh, of the extent of the publication before that will be taken into account uh, in, in damages. And uh, the court ha in the two cases has said, or at least in the in third of the cases has said that uh, repeated postings normally should not give rise to the same, not normally should not give rise to as high an award of damages as original uh, postings. Aggravated damages should only be awarded when some sort of additional harm or circumstances is proved. There should be no presumption in favor of aggravated damages, and there should be no aggravated damages whatsoever if the plaintiff is a corporation. Um, there were other uh, inroads made in damages assessment. Uh, the mere fact that a defendant re repeats the, the statement by relying on the defense of justification should not mean that aggravated damages are, should be awarded. Uh, and that is something of a, a reversal of the position that applied in Hong Kong. And uh, finally, uh, the court in both, both in Oriental Delhi and, and Blakeney suggested that um, 
that a, a corporate plaintiff doesn't have feelings, doesn't have a soul, so, <laughs> so it uh, uh, should not be entitled to very high award of damages. So in summary, the position in Hong Kong, I think, is that we have a judiciary that is inclined toward reform. Now, this is not to say that every case uh, has been decided uh, favorably, or at least I in, in a liberal way. There are examples uh, uh, where the decision has, reached, has been quite to the uh, contrary. And, and litigants have been surprised, but by and large, uh, the judiciary is, is, is playing a serious role here, as, as, as Lord Lester suggested. It falls to the judiciary to do so, and, and by and large, they do so. Um, the court is prepared to take a leadership role. Actually, we saw this as long ago as the year 2001, when the Court of Final Appeal in Hong Kong, uh, in the Cheng case, um, rewrote to some degree the law of fair comment, now known as honest opinion. Much has taken place since then, but that was probably the first inroad on the defense. And the court is also prepared to be adaptable and to take uh, guidance from elsewhere. Uh, the, the, the court has here has uh, uh, not only uh, embraced the decisions in Reynolds and Jamil, but also has uh, extended it to some degree using the Privy Council case in, in SIGA. Now, number of concerns that I have uh, about uh, the way that uh, the, 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 the law reform is progressing through, uh, through case law. Um, I, I, I have some difficulty reading, when I read the, uh, the FIBA Works case in the Court of Final Appeal, I have some difficulty with the, the attempts by the court to, to um, build a modern law out of the old precedents and uh, what I uh, am calling uh, judicial contortions. Uh, and I think that this, this tendency to do so, which is in a way the, the common law practice, uh, may uh, distract uh, the court from the real issues and, and perhaps uh, the court needs to address full on what is really at stake here when we're talking about these sorts of online real-time postings that every, everyone wants to make. If the law is to be changed in order to accommodate that kind of communication, then maybe that could be discussed a little more openly rather than merely speaking about the chilling effect uh, which is, isn't all that, all that meaningful. In the, in the FIFA Works case that I discussed firstly, um, there is this binary approach taken. Uh, we must I either find that the, that the defendant was either a publisher or was a subordinate publisher, or, or was a publisher or a non-publisher if you take the notice board approach, whereas perhaps there are subtleties that should be taken into account that are not really addressed when you take that kind of binary approach. In fact, neither of those approaches are really very satisfactory reading uh, the reasoning uh, uh, in, in the uh, FIBA Works case. And then also, um, given the ruling in the FIBA Works case, it suggests that some websites will have, uh, may, may not have any protection at all because uh, if indeed the volume of traffic is not that great, then perhaps the defendant is not a subordinate publisher after all and, and therefore may not have the defense of innocent dissemination. And then other thoughts come to my mind in Hong Kong where we really don't have access or, the, or really a, a, a serious hope of statutory reform at this stage. Um, and I wonder uh, what's really happening, whether it is technology that is leading the law here. I think to some degree that is happening, but I think it should be the other way around. I think this is, a, this is maybe true around the world. Then I ask, is, uh, is, is the common law approach suited to achieving the kinds of reforms that are needed in the, in the information era. Uh, and uh, uh, on the one hand, maybe it is, because we're bound to see further changes in technology that's going to require other responses in the law. But then there are, there are reforms that I don't think judges can make. For instance, uh, in, in the 2013 Act, you have now a, uh, a, a single publication rule. But I ask, how could a judge, how could a court introduce that uh, by way of reform? That strikes me as something that would be really the, for the for the legislature to do. And then in Hong Kong, could, could statutory, is statutory reform possible? I mean, it's probably the way forward, but is it possible? And in my view, given the way that Hong Kong operates, it probably needs to be sold to the government on a commercial basis. I mean, I think <laughs> the government needs to be persuaded that this is really going to work well for Hong Kong and attract, well, hopefully not libel tourism. <laughs> but uh, I, this is the last line of my last slide. Uh, you know, you've made a claim, Toronto has made a claim for being, you know, the, the potential <laughs> suitable place for, for uh, the libel uh, center of the world in, in, in Belfast. But I think that, if, my, if I may suggest that Hong Kong may have <laughs> one leg up on, on, on both places. Uh, and uh, and that, that's really all, all that I have to say. Thank you, Rick.
However, I think that's a form of business promotion we might not want to encourage. <laughs> Um, but Rick, you're right um, in that um, the courts have, have tried to look at things in a more responsible way, particularly with the damages. Uh, it was clear um, about 12, 15 years ago when there was the first major jury award in hundreds of thousands of dollars in Hong Kong for damages. Suddenly, that was encouraging other libel cases uh, to be filed. So we'll see what happens now that damages have been tapped down. Our final speaker is Harry Roque. Well, it's one o'clock in the afternoon. As you can see, I'm very healthy, but please don't look at me as your lunch. <laughs> now, um, let me start off with the UN committee view that Peter discussed. I do have to begin by saying that that um, submission was a direct result of the very first conference that we had here in Hong Kong. No? That gave me the opportunity to meet Stuart and um, Peter. Um, both of them were then in OSI Media. And that gave us the resources, basically, to go to Davao, where this journalist was already serving time for a conviction for libel. No? Davao is an hour, 45 minutes away by plane from the Philippines. No? Now, of course, we've always wanted to bring the case to the UN Committee on Human Rights. And the reason is we know that if we were to go to the Philippine Supreme Court, even if we have adopted Sullivan, and even if we have adopted the definition of malice as actual disregard for the truth, the reality is, being also a civil law country, we have also, in the most latest pronouncement of the Supreme Court and libel, adopted the common law meaning of malice to include ill will or hatred. No? So we thought that was going to be a very difficult job to convince the um, Philippine Supreme Court to abandon that kind of definition of malice and just go with Sullivan alone. So the opportunity finally came through Mr. Adonis, who unfortunately, as I said, had to spend a, a year in jail. The tormentor was not a senator. He was higher than a senator. He was House Speaker. And in the Philippines, he's the fourth highest um, official of the land. No? Now, he sued, of course, the journalist in his, ho in his own congressional district. And of course, when your House Speaker, number four highest official of the land, the local court and the local prosecutors would be more than happy you know, to oblige Mr. Speaker with a conviction. Now, of course, the subject was already discussed by Peter. It was because Mr. Adonis broadcasted um, an incident where Mr. Speaker was seen running around the lobby of a Manila um, hotel naked, apparently because the husband of his paramour chanced upon them on that hotel. No? But what Peter did not say was the reason why he had to make sure that Mr. Adonis would spend time in jail was he dramatized, not the running around, but the fact, but allegedly what Adonis claims was a fact. No? That was a certain public official was forced to perform a very private act on the private part of the husband of the paramour. <laughs> now, that's why he had to go to jail. <laughs> now, in our communication, we argued that criminal libel was um, contrary to Article 19 of um, the ICCPR because, number one, it was not proportionate to the means that it seeks to protect, and which is to protect the privacy of those who want to be left alone, private individuals. And we also said that there was a, an alternative, which is civil libel. No? Now, the um, Human Rights um, Committee agreed with us. And in agreeing with us, um, the Philippine government was reminded of its general comment number 34, which said, number one, that defamation laws must be crafted to ensure that they do not stifle freedom of expression, that all criminal libels must recognize the defense of truth, and that as far as public figures are concerned, then they should recognize that the burden to prove actual malice should be on the public figure. No? Now, the view ordered the Philippine government to pro provide Mr. Adonis with compensation for the time that he spent in jail, as well as to take steps to prevent similar violations in the future, including by reviewing the relevant libel legislation. Well, the problem was, a year after the view, the Philippine government not only failed to implement the view, they also legislated on what is known as the Cyber Acts Prevention Act of 2012. No? And under this law, um, libel on the internet was also made criminal. No? 
Of course, the first line of argument in the Supreme Court now, where Mr. Adonis was one of the petitioners that challenged the constitutionality of the cyber law, was the fact that given that there was a view, even if that view per se is not binding, it is still evidence of breach of a treaty obligation, Pacta Sunt Servanda. And in the Philippines, we have a provision in our constitution which says that Pacta Sunt Servanda, as an example of a generally accepted principle of international law, has the effect of domestic law. No? Now, what is some um, provided in the cyber crimes law? Well, in the enumeration of content-based restrictions, you find Article 4C4, which is libel. Now, you can see that 4C4 does not create the crime of libel on the internet. It simply clarifies that libel on the internet is a publication, which in turn is the element for criminal libel under the revised penal code. Now, in addition to that, it also punishes aiding or abetting in the commission of any cybercrime, including libel, as well as um, an attempt, no? It also punishes an attempted libel. I don't know what that is. Now, of course, the petition now in the Supreme Court, which, is, which has been pending, is that it infringes on freedom of expression, as well as it violates the principle of Pacta Sunt Servanda. Our problem was in implementing a UN Human Rights Committee view, even the um, um, optional protocol to the ICCPR, which gave it jurisdiction, says that UN Committee Human Rights views are not binding. So we had to argue that its binding nature is not because it exists, but because it is evidence of Pacta Sunt Servanda. We also pointed to the fact that no less than the International Court of Justice has given weight to the decision of Human Rights Committee to the Human Rights Committee because these are very authoritative um, interpretations of highly qualified experts who were selected to implement the provisions of the ICCPR. We also pointed to the fact that by jurisprudence, the court, even if these views are non-binding, has nonetheless adopted these views as, for, as part of Philippine jurisprudence. So we argued if the Philippines can apply views of the Human Rights Committee when they were given against other countries, why shouldn't it apply a view when it was expressed against the government of the Republic? Now, so we have three grounds for challenging um, libel. Number one, the traditional ground of attacking it, and that is it is void in its face, facial challenge, because of the American concept of overbreath. Number two, we also said that cyber libel itself is unconstitutional because it is vague, and of course, it's a violation of treaty obligation. Now, overbreath is an American doctrine no, from Broderick versus Oklahoma, which says that you can subject a criminal statute to facial challenge if its application will cover the exercise of protected rights. And the reason for this is these protected rights are so important, so much so that you want to avoid a chill in the exercise of these rights. Now, we said there was overbreath here because, number one, the internet is new, and we don't know what exactly is being penalized. It could cover protected speech. And number two, because in fact, it, is in, it has been declared as um, facially invalid in the United States for being overbroad. Now, why did we say that internet on, I mean, libel on the internet itself is unconstitutional because of overbreath? Well, number one, we don't know if retweets on Twitter can be libelous. We don't know if pushing the like button on the Facebook is libelous. In fact, a US federal court only declared that um, pressing the like button is protected speech. No, this is fairly new, and this is only a court of first instance decision. We don't know if the intermediary is liable for comments appearing on a blog. Certainly in Thailand, a, an intermediary was held liable for less majes. We don't know if reposting a link could be actionable. And we don't know if the shield law will apply also to bloggers. No? Now, the problem with criminal libel in the Philippines is that it has a special provision on who are responsible for libel. It's not just the author. It's any person who shall publish, exhibit, or cause a publication or exhibition of any defamation in writing or any other similar means. So given this definition of who are liable, are ISPs now liable? Are the owners of social networking um, liable? Google and Yahoo, are, could they be held liable? Even the telcos, because without the telcos, you will not have the internet connection. No? 
But of course, a more substantive attack was on the basis of New York Times versus <coughs> Sullivan. No? We have adopted New York Times Sullivan, and therefore, uh, we have adopted the rule that words by itself are not actionable unless there is actual malice. And the definition of actual malice is um, utterance which is false or in utter disregard of its falsity. Now, in Garrison versus Louisiana, the standard of um, Sal Sullivan was adopted in criminal statutes. And Garrison was, in fact, one of the very first decisions of the US Supreme Court where it had declared a state criminal libel law as being unconstitutional on the basis of overbreadth. And the rationale for this is that erroneous statement is inevitable in a free debate. Now, the Philippine Supreme Court has adopted Sullivan. But the problem is, in its later decisions, it has also adopted the common law definition of malice as including ill will or hatred or malvolent um, intent. No? And so we have actually a situation covered by Garrison, because in Garrison, the, court in, the US Supreme Court, in fact, held that it does not matter if a statement was written with hatred, provided that you cannot show that there was actual malice pursuant to Sullivan. Now, we don't know how the court will actually decide. It's not looking good, no? Well, but before I give you my prognosis, we had actually a major problem amongst the petitioners. There were around 17 petitioners, and the petitioners basically voted on who was going to argue. I was selected to argue the provision on libel as well as um, cyber sex, and you know, that was the longest discussion for the court. Our problem was a day before the oral arguments, it turns out that two petitioners did not want to challenge the constitutionality of libel per se. And the reason is one of them is one of the biggest firms in the country that has been giving us a lot of job because they have been suing an opposition newspaper um, headed by one of our clients, beneficiaries of MLDN, and they don't want to lose this um, weapon, um, you know, the threat that they could put people behind bars for libel. No? And a second um, petitioner was because his brother for some reason, was able to acquire ownership of the domain name .ph. And as a, as a result of which, netizens were really saying nasty things about him. And he has decided to sue every single netizen for libel, no, for every comment that he did not like. No? So he was not about ready to give up on criminal libel. And that is why we had to, as a compromise, we had to go into a very long discussion of well, in this regard, cyber libel may be unconstitutional because we don't know what exactly is being punished. No? But in my mind, if you look again at the language of 4C4, it does not criminalize libel. So if we want to question the constitutionality of libel, it has to be on the basis of overbreath for Suwan to Garrison and not because of the cyber prevention law alone. No? Well, as I said, the compromise was I devoted a lot more time to um, discussing why internet libel is violative of overbreath and why it is vague, but still argued that um, Garrison should be adopted by the Philippine Supreme Court. Now, why do I say that um, we have reasons to worry? Number one, it's taken the court a very long time to decide. Oral arguments were conducted in February. Until now, there's no decision. Uh, number two, there were 17 petitions, and the court has discretion to determine which of the petitioners will be first, because that will be the name of the case. They did not choose Alexander Adonis, which means that the court was not too concerned about um, declaring libel as unconstitutional. No? They chose instead the name of my colleague in the uh, University of the Philippines who questioned the um, infrastructure side of the law insofar as it affects the internet industry. No? So I think. Therefore, that they may say that 4C4 is unconstitutional because we don't know what exactly is punished, but they may retain libel in the statute book. I hope I'm wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. So we've had a wide variety of views and positions here. And I had asked the speakers to think about this next question. I want to follow up with them. There's been a lot of change and movement in all these jurisdictions in defamation law, forward and backward. What do you think um, has been the 
one of the biggest factors in promoting change. Some of it is a change in government, okay, so we can get a defamation law. Some of it could be a change in um, who's sitting on the court, who's hearing the case, and so forth. But in your particular jurisdiction, what do you think might be the biggest Im impact um, for change in legislation and case law uh, as we move forward? Heather. I was going to say going forward, well, we'll have to see, because we, of course we have the Act, but, but just, just looking at one of the things that did, um, that was an impact uh, a spur for change, what was uh, focus on a case. Uh, 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 um, I think it was Paul who was talking about needing a case with sensationally good facts to really get a, a good reform, and uh, we had a case in the UK in which um, an association, a professional association, the British Chiropractic Association sued a writer called Simon Singh, who was the co-author of the book um, you know, with, a, with a professor um, a, a debunking what he saw as uh, dangerous uh, alternative therapies. And uh, there was an article in The Guardian which he published, and the Chiropractic Association sued, not The Guardian, but Simon Singh over effectively a couple of lines in, in the report. And th this case p picked up a tremendous amount of publicity. And I suspect that the uh, event that uh, Andrew went to, which was a comedy benefit, um, was um, something that was, that was um, driven by that campaign. So we had a case in which was perceived by the public to be a very dangerous use of defamation law by, uh, by a body. So in other words, not an individual who'd suffered harm, but by a body which was seeking to protect its reputation against a, a, a journalist, well, not even a journalist, I mean, he's, he's, a, he's a, 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 a science writer, uh, and that was seen as very, uh, very dangerous. Um, I should uh, perhaps say at this point that I was acting for the British Chiropractic Association, and, uh, and we succeeded in front of the judge um, uh, uh, by application of the, the law as it was by very um, applying the sort of strict rules. But, but the public opinion which was got behind the case really changed the climate. So by the time we got to the Court of Appeals, um, of course, I mean, judges wouldn't um, just you know, <laughs> make a decision because the public wanted it. But I think there really was a change in culture. So sometimes you have a case which is either bad or perceived as bad and generates change. Um, <coughs> Uh, and um, yeah, so I, th I think that that has been part of the. We, we, our law was seen by that case, by uh, libel tourist cases, as being out of line. And once you get badly out of line, that's a real spur for change. And I, I, I sort of picked that going backwards because from now we have the Defamation Act, so we have a real opportunity to carry change forward. That the, cult the culture has shifted, and the question is, how will that be applied in practice? Um, um. Look, I could just say something briefly on the uh, Australian law. We underwent um, reform in some ways uh, substantial about seven, eight years ago. Every state and territory in Australia had different law, eight of them. Some similarities, but some peculiar differences. And after decades of attempts, they now have substantially uniform law. So that was statutory change. Um, I think brought about by a strange combination of political factors. A, a federal government and, a, and an attorney general that sort of threatened to try and overrule them and in fact couldn't enact constitutionally one law for everything, but could have done quite a lot. And that really got the states together to say, okay, we'll pass something, and they did. I think now that's really interesting because I'm not sure if the Australian states and territories will ever agree to another uniform change in the law. So I'm not sure that there's any prospect for statutory uniform reform in Australia, which means the future is the judges, um, which in Australia maybe haven't been as um, hopeful uh, as maybe you'd have in Hong Kong. Um, no. Well, I guess I mentioned in, in Canada that uh, partly it was shame, um, but, <laughs> uh, but I didn't mention too, and I guess it picks up on what Heather said and, and what I had mentioned before was that um, if you read the opening lines of the Grant case, um, uh, Chief Justice McLaughlin says, this case comes to us after a jury awarded a million and a half dollars in damages for a newspaper writing a public interest story and we're hearing another case called Kusan. they heard at the same time, which also had terrible jury damage awards and it says, and the, the media submit basically there's something wrong with our law. 
and the, the rest of her judgment could be summed up in uh, just a few words, which would be, and they're right, because it was really those facts uh, that finally forced the hand of the court. Um, I think some of it can be judges, too. I think one of the problems we've had in Canada is we have, uh, we don't, unlike in London, have a, a libel judges who hear the trials and know what they're doing. Um, and so we've lacked the expertise, but we do have a few good judges now who are, who are very interested and believe in this stuff. I think the big challenge going forward, and I think I see it a, a, a little bit already starting in Canada, is, is I think we're going to see um, our law become even more receptive to free speech because of the recognition of the power of the internet. Which is why we're all here and that you can't stop anything. And uh, you know, they've already said that. I didn't mention a case called Crooks and Newton where our Supreme Court said there's basically immunity for hyperlinks. It's an interesting little decision on what do you do with the internet and it's, a, it's, it's quite a good one. So I would commend that to you. Well, although I was um rather pessimistic about um, the um, um, declaration that criminal libel would be declared unconstitutional. Now, the reality is the passage of the Cyber um, Prevention Act of 2012 resulted in a rebirth of activism in the Philippines. And it was actually literally just amazing. As a professional activist myself, our problem since Marcos was how to get the young people involved because they well, apparently don't like going out into the streets um, today, you know? but they found the internet now as a tool for expression. And I think that's one reason why the court has not issued its decision, if it is the decision that I think it will come out. Now, they're afraid that the netizens will actually attack the court in the same way that the netizens attack the legislators responsible for the Cyber Prevention Act. No? In any case, I think we can only move forward because um, I think the young people of the Philippines in particular has found something that they like and something that they will use to influence policy in the country. I think this is the beginning of genuine change. Yeah, I think that um, adding to what I had said earlier, that uh, the, um, the internet itself uh, has uh, triggered change around the world and, and no less in Hong Kong. Um, and uh, so the judges are responding to that. But also uh, echoing what Lord Lester said earlier this morning, um, the judiciary in Hong Kong is independent and is a robust judiciary which understands its role in the context of, um, of Hong Kong and China and, uh, and really does want to be, mean be seen as meaningful, does not want to become a mere rubber stamp or, or such a thing. Uh, and so I think much, is, much credit is to go to the judiciary, and, uh, to the court of final appeal for that matter, and, and the way that it, that it views itself in the context of uh, of uh, two systems in, in one country. Thank you, Rick. Lord Lester. I think in the case of, of England, it's a bit different. Um, if you read this excellent little textbook, which about the new act by James Price, they think it's all because of American law. They think that it's because the Americans started to uh, arm English libel awards in the States. But that's not at all correct. Mm -hmm. I think that it's much more the effect of the European Human Rights Convention. Mm -hmm. Because when, when I began, there was no right to free speech legally in Britain at all. Uh, there was a political value, but no legal value. Uh, and so people like me were able to go to Strasbourg when the law laws came out with decisions that were plainly wrong in the way that they treated free speech. Uh, the Thalidomide case was the, the first of those. We were able to go to Strasbourg and the European Court regularly said that the English law lords had got it wrong, which was great because it then made the English law lords of that generation think, dear, oh dear, we better do something about this. Uh, and that then happened. And we moved over those to, to, entirely because of European influence. Our courts began to use the common law to create a constitutional right to free speech in the absence of a, of a written one. Uh, and then I think what happened was partly some disgraceful cases, mm -hmm. but also the human rights organizations. Mm -hmm. What really happened was that Sense About Science, English Pen, Article 19, Index on Censorship got going and organized a huge campaign. Mm -hmm. And then that affected people like me, my political party then passed a resolution on the subject, the Liberal Democrats did, 
Uh, and then I had a particularly outrageous experience in Northern Ireland in a case which convinced <laughs> me that the time had come to legislate, and so it went on. And then the politicians from all three parties began also, I think, to realize that our law, so it's a combination of all those things. I think the explanation given in, in, in this book is, is, is ridiculous, actually. Yeah. <laughs> it's not because, it was certainly not because of what the Americans were doing. Right, right. Must, yeah, sure. Just in terms of changing the culture, I think Anthony's absolutely right. Um, but, but one of the things that, that changed it for us was the, the, there was nothing new about the European Convention, but the Human Rights Act being introduced into our jurisdiction yes. changed it. And, it. and it changed it not just because we had a law, but because there was an enormous program of education of lawyers. We all became human rights lawyers if we weren't already overnight. But the judiciary were trained. And, and, so that, uh, and that greater awareness of principles got into the system so that it, it, the, we're now, it's now part of our institution, part of our fabric. And that was an enormous cultural change. So a lot, well, unfortunately here in Asia, we don't have the same you know, human rights mechanism um, a bit behind the times. Um, but that said, it seems that the, that the message here is in part education to human rights principles, educating and engaging the public in a real uh, and practical way, uh, somehow harnessing the netizens uh, who see this runaway train known as the internet, um, it has left the station. And so how does the law stay on top of that, as you brought out uh, in your talk, Heather? And finally, of course, making sure you have darn good judges. So I think that kind of sums up our talk. I'm sorry we were uh, hoping to plan for a Q&A. We don't uh, have time for that. Um, I do want to point out, I had um, asked uh, Peter Bartlett to be a discussant as well as uh, for Australia. And he has some other points he wants to make, not at this point, but do please seek him out if you want to talk more about Australia. He'll be on a panel uh, later on on privacy. And George Huang uh, from Singapore also had some interesting uh, aspects. And we might try to get him to speak at a later time. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. I really appreciate it. And please give a hand to our panel. <laughs>